Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with a Lawyer. I am attorney Devin Shanley with Peterson, Burke & Cross here to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, estate planning. Um, before we get started, I do want to cover a couple issues, as I always do. The first is going to be that this is a question and answer session. So if you are watching live, hi, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Please participate. Please ask questions. I try and keep an eye on things, and I will answer anything that comes up. Well, I shouldn't say anything because that brings us to the second disclaimer. I will not answer questions that deal with specific legal issues. If you have a question that has specific things that come up, hey, Devin, I'm dealing with this and this and this. What's your advice or what do you think? Uh, I'm going to say that's a great question. Please call our office or uh, contact my paralegal team and schedule a time for us to have a consultation because that is going to be the best time for us to talk about that uh, rather than in this area. The reason why is if I just start handing out legal advice to people I don't know and can't run conflict checks, that might form an attorney-client relationship. That's not what we want to do with this. What we want to do is just give you information, let you get a chance to meet the attorneys here, today it's me, and uh, get a chance to learn a little bit more so that you can ask the right questions and say, hey, that sounds like a great attorney, I will contact him. So give us a call, 920-831-0300, or contact us through our Facebook page or through our website, just to schedule a consultation, get a little bit more information, and see if we can be the right fit for you. Uh, so, also today, uh, my lunch today, I'm really looking forward to. It is from the watering hole out in Howard. Uh, I got the Buffalo Bill. I don't always order the Buffalo chicken sandwiches, but when I do, it's going to be a real treat. Uh, my paralegal actually came in as she was giving me this for my lunch today, and she ordered the same thing, and she just said it was delicious. Uh, also, the good people at the watering hole asked me to pass along a couple messages, and, and one of them is uh, that they are forming cornhole and volleyball leagues, which I am really looking forward to. Uh, it, I, this time of year, I always love to sneak in a couple games of cornhole. It's a great tailgating game, and especially this fall without the tailgating, uh, that seems like that could really hit the spot. So if you're looking to join a volleyball league, cornhole league, keep the watering hole on belt in Howard uh, in mind. They're great, great atmosphere wonderful food. Uh, so thank you and thank you for sponsoring our lunch today. So trusts. For those who don't know, haven't seen one of our, our videos, haven't heard me talk about this in the past, uh, there might be a question in general of what is a trust. A trust is a big pretend box. It holds stuff. It's also the relationship between a grantor, a trustee, and a beneficiary. It is a very common technique used to try to avoid probate. Uh, if you don't know what probate is, I know there are previous Lunch with the Lawyers that deal with that issue in particular. Uh, please watch that. Great information brought to you by a very smart and handsome attorney. Uh, when we talk about a trust, there's a lot of people who have a lot of really strong opinions about this particular estate planning tool. Part of the reason why is I believe that there may be some attorneys out there who really try to upsell people into trusts. There are also attorneys out there who just believe everybody should have a trust. Everybody should have a trust. It's a great way to avoid probate. Just everybody have a trust. You get a trust and you get a trust. Everybody gets a trust. That's wonderful. Uh, I don't believe in that. I believe that there are a lot of different ways to avoid probate. Regular viewers know that I'm also of the mindset that Sometimes probate is not a bad thing. All of these things are just legal tools, they're legal options, and it's easy to get blinded to opportunities if you just say, I'm never going to use this. Sometimes that's the appropriate remedy. Uh, but you got to know why, and you got to know what you're getting out of that. So why would we use a trust? Really, it's going to break down into one of two options for the most part. Either you've got some, or three options, I'm sorry, three options. Either you have a specialized legal situation 
that is going to require a trust to create a good resolution to it. Either you're, you're going to have some sort of specialized property that is difficult to avoid probate with, and the trust just happens to be the easiest way of smoothing out that administration. Or three, you have some sort of specialized gift in mind that you need to control over a long period of time, and the trust is the most efficient way of handling that. So let's go walk through these three basic situations. First, a specialized legal issue. The most common special legal issues that are going to cause you to need a trust are going to be something around the concept of the estate tax, or it's going to be some sort of Medicaid qualification. There's others. I'm not saying that's the only two. There might be other things that cause you to need to get property out of your hands, but still within your control. Uh, at that point, you're going to be using something called an irrevocable trust. Uh, again, still a pretend box. You set up the rules for it, but then once you put that property into the box, it's not yours anymore. The box is its own living thing. And uh, it's its own living thing. And as a result, it holds it for it. Uh, great question was the estate tax. The estate tax is a federal tax that allows you, that taxes on the privilege to be able to give property to someone else after you die. And when I mean somebody else, I mean an entity that is not either the federal government or a charity. This tax is something that is very much feared. It's talked about a lot. You hear it a lot of times when you hear of something called death taxes, they're talking about the estate tax at that point. And we'll probably hear about it again because it's political season and it's a very easy tax to just pick on and say, they'll tax you when they die. Um, reality is this tax hits about less than 1% of the population. The estate tax has a unified exemption that pairs with something called the gift tax that is the tax upon giving people when you're alive. If you ever hear people say, well, you can give away and they'll list off some amount of money tax-free every year. That is true. That deals with the gift tax. The gift tax right now, the annual exemption is $15,000. So if you're going to give someone more than $15,000, you're going to pay gift taxes, except probably not because you also have the lifetime exemption that covers both gift and estate tax. You do need to file a gift tax return if you're going to go above $15,000 though. Uh, that's something, so like if you give a house to your kids, you should talk to your accountant because uh, you'll need to probably file a gift tax return that year just to climb some of your exemption, your lifetime exemption, which is right now for an individual $11 million. Now this is 2020, so if future you is watching and it's 2025, it might not still be $11 million talk to your accountant and your uh, attorney about the current exemption. But right now it's set at $11 million for an individual, $22 million for a married couple, and you get another $15,000 that you can give away per person per year. So when we talk about these sorts of taxes, unless you have a lot of money, this is not something that probably coming up in the same way. Now, Way back when, in something called, that I like to refer to, the bad old days, when the gift tax exemption, or the, the unified gift and estate tax exemption was down at a million dollars, then that started to get a little stickier. We started to use more of these sorts of tools because that would hit a lot more of the population, uh, especially since life, or life insurance would be included into that million dollars. So if you had a half million term policy or a $2 million term policy, for business assets or just because, then yeah, that would become a taxable estate and you need to do some specialized planning. These days at 11 million, unless you've got a really asset rich business, chances are if you've got that much money or that much assets around, you've, you probably have your attorney on speed dial. If not, please give me a call. The other issue besides estate tax that's going to cause that as a specialized legal issue is going to be Medicaid. 
when you're talking about Medicaid planning, this is the protect your house from the nursing home sort of pitch. Does that work? Yes, it, it does. Uh, a Medicaid trust is going to be a trust that's going to be built, that's going to be again an irrevocable trust. Uh, for it not to qualify as an asset of yours, you cannot be listed as the beneficiary. So what this is going to be is essentially putting an asset into an irrevocable trust that you may or may not be in control of, but you will gain zero benefit from. You cannot be a beneficiary in any way, shape, or form, and that's that. Now, that can be a very valuable thing if you're going to say, need some sort of land that uh, has a lot of emotional connection to and you want to make sure that that stays in the family. That can be a very strong trust for that. But that's going to be very fact driven and that's going to be driven by what you have, what you want to accomplish, and what the legal issues you want to avoid are. If you're going to be doing something like this for Medicaid planning, you're going to want to do it sooner than later because right now Medicaid has got a five-year look-back window for any gifts. That would include gifts to a trust in this nature. So uh, that's going to be something to be very, very mindful of. Outside of that, whenever you have a specialized legal issue, you're going to want to be aware of what the legal issue is, what you have, and what you're trying to protect. You're typically, as you can tell from what I've just said so far, going to be using some sort of what's called irrevocable trust. Because usually these sorts of legal issues are going to be the idea of, I need to get this out of my control. I need to protect the asset. Uh, and that typically means protecting it from yourself, which means you need something other than you to hold it. Specialized items. A lot of times when we use a trust, people are trying to avoid probate. A trust is a classic tool to avoid probate. And when I say specialized items and why that drives it is these days, for the most part, there are very easy, more cost-effective ways to avoid probate with, uh, with transfers, typically that I refer to as non-probate transfers, the most common of which is putting a beneficiary on an account. Uh, for those who watched last week when I talked about is a lawyer needed for an estate plan, which by the way, if you haven't, after you're done, watch it. It's a great video. A beneficiary status, when you meet with your financial advisor, when you meet with your banker, you might actually be doing estate planning. You come in, you say, they say, do you, who do you want to give this to after you die? And you say, I don't know, Jimmy. Well, now Jimmy is going to have that sort of beneficiary status that will transfer all the money to him. That doesn't go through probate. So for a lot of assets like accounts, 401ks, retirement accounts, mutual funds, anything that's going to be managed through some sort of beneficiary that you're probably not going to need a trust for just because of the asset. Now, if you have something like a small business, you can't walk up to your financial planner and say, you know, I started this machine shop and it's doing a really good business or this, this auto body shop. I'd like to trans that, transfer that to my son after I die. They might work through a business plan with you or, a, you know, you might have to hire an attorney for a buy-sell, but it's not something where you can just put a quick transfer on death on. Instead, if you're going to pass that business on, and in case you die unexpectedly, then that will probably need to go through the probate process unless you have some other mechanism that can manage that. And a trust is a very easy tool for that. That is where you're going to start to get into that. That also counts for personal property. If you've got a Monet sitting in your foyer or uh, a very valuable piece of jewelry or old bars buried in your backyard, you can't really put some sort of transfer and death on that very easily. Now, you could sell your son, there's gold bars buried in the backyard. You just go, you know, dig that up and take it when I'm dead. But then your son knows about your buried gold in the backyard, and that may or may not be a good thing, depending upon how much you trust your son. A trust can be an easy mechanism to hold that sort of property that may cause this sort of probate issue. The other thing is going to be something called ancillary probate. Ancillary probate is uh, draws upon an issue of jurisdiction. And again, regular viewers know I don't always like to use this many lawyer words all in a row. Unfortunately, it's a little unavoidable in this situation. 
so let's talk about jurisdiction. The nation is made up of 50 states. That means there are 50 different areas that can make up their own laws and they have their own court system that manage all of these different things. If you have property in one state, say Iowa, and you live primarily in a different state, say Wisconsin, and you die, your probate will be handled through the Wisconsin court. But the Wisconsin court may not have jurisdiction over the property you own in Iowa. That's a problem because you're going to need to have something in Iowa that says this person can walk in and sell that property because dead people don't sell things. So you would need to form what's called an ancillary probate. So not just the first probate, but a second smaller probate that says, okay, we're starting this probate just to sell this stuff. And then we'll ship everything back to the first probate and get that going. That can double up administration and add extra costs un for, for no good reason. A good way around that is the trust because the trust is a big pretend box. It will take care of all of the property it owns and it can own property in Wisconsin or Iowa or Alaska or in many other places. So if you've got multiple different vacation homes, if you've got uh, a boat that's docked in a different state, if you've got something where it's going to rest in a very, con it's a concrete item that risks in a concrete place that's not the state that you're living in, primarily Wisconsin, then a trust can be a good area to deal with that. Uh, so I got a question come in. Can you explain irrevocable trusts? What does uh, that mean versus revocable? This is a great question that I kind of missed on and I apologize. I always like to break things down to basic options and one of the most basic options for irrevocable trusts versus revocable trusts revolves around the relationship between the grantor and the trustee and to some degree the beneficiary. And that's, can the grantor change the rules of the trust? If the answer is yes, the trust is considered revocable. That means the grantor can walk in and say, trust done at any time. Since the, tr since the trust can be ended by the grantor at any time, the grantor also reserves the right to terminate or change basically any small thing about it. The trust is completely malleable to the grantor's whims. An irrevocable trust is a trust where once the grantor signs it, the grantor can't change the rules. The rules are set. That means whenever the grantor gives the property to the irrevocable trust, then it becomes the property of the trust. A lot of times with revocable trusts, what happens is the grantor puts the property in, but at its core, everybody will consider the revocable trust as an extension of the grantor, since the grantor can end it at any time, can change anything about it. Uh, to help really elaborate this, I'm going to try and tell a story that might go a smidge long, and then I will, uh, but I'll be mindful of the time because I still have a little bit more to talk about. It goes like this. It's a hypothetical. Uh, I say, imagine if, uh, I, I, actually, I start with this story. I go, my wife loves uh, going to uh, yard sales and garage sales. She swears that every woman in Wisconsin loves to go to garage sales. Maybe this is true. Maybe it's not. If it's not true and you're a woman who lives in Wisconsin who hates garage sales, please leave a message in the comments because I'd love to look at my wife and say, see, you were wrong. But otherwise she's right. And so we go and, you know, she's shopping around and stuff and I have to mind the kids and it's always kind of a bother. And at one point, let's say she comes to me one day and says, Devin, look at this painting and it's Starry Night. And I go, okay, that's great because we have a lot of different copies of Starry Nights, one of her favorite paintings. And she really wants to buy it. And she says it's $10. And I go, $10 for something at a garage sale? Why are you paying $10 for something at a garage sale? But she convinces me because, you know, she does that. And so, uh, you know, I say, fine, whatever. And she gives two $5 bills to uh, the guy sitting at the folding card table at the garage sale. And now that painting is mine. Uh, I'm not really happy about it, but I don't think the guy at the card table is going to give me my two $5 bills back. So whatever, we go home. And, you know, we get home and I put it in the foyer because I paid $10 for something at a garage sale. And I find I really like it. It kind of speaks to me. The artwork is good. It seems to really look like Starry Night. So awesome. 
uh, we go about, my dad comes to me and he says, Devin, I really love the show. Uh, I, I really love the show uh, uh, Antique Roadshow. You sh and they're coming to Green Bay. You should take that to Antiques Roadshow and see if it's worth something. And I think to myself, I really don't want to go to Antiques Roadshow, but whatever. So I go to Antiques Roadshow and I'm there with my painting that I bought at a garage sale. And all of a sudden I start seeing cameras appear by me and all sorts of stuff and more and more of the experts come in and talk to me. And I'm thinking to myself, am I going to be one of those jerks on Antiques Roadshow who comes in and thinks this is going to be something valuable and they tell me it's worthless and I hear a womp womp in the background and I get embarrassed in front of the nation? And it turns out it was actually Starry Night. I go, hey, all right, I got a priceless piece of art because that at Antiques Roadshow, this is awesome. So I, I I smile and I feel really good about myself and I put it up and I, you know, and I realized then one day, a couple of weeks later, I just told the entire nation I've got Starry Night sitting in my foyer. This is probably a bad idea. So I walk down to the Neville Public Museum, which is right by our office, and I go, Neville Public Museum, would you like Starry Night? They go, yes, yes, we would. I say, awesome, you can have it, but I want it back at any time. At this point, I turn around and I look at the client and I say, have I really given Starry Night to the Neville Public Museum? And most of the time they say, no. This is the core of a revocable living trust. Since you can yank it back at any time, you can change all the terms of it, it's not really given. As a result, predators can still collect against you with the uh, with with a revocable trust. Those assets can still be considered yours if you're trying to apply for Medicaid. But let's change up my example with Starry Night again. And I walk to the Neville Public Museum and I just say, you know what? I only paid ten bucks for the thing, and I want to benefit Green Bay for some reason. So you just take it. It's yours now. At that point, someone thinks to themselves, Devin owes me money. I'm going to sue him because he's now a starry night. And then I kind of shrug my shoulders and go, no, I don't. I gave it away. Um, at that point, it becomes a lot clearer that it's not mine. They can't collect against me and they can't take it from me because I've given it away. That's the concept of an irrevocable trust. Since you've set the rules for it, you still have control over the item to a certain degree, but it's not really yours. That's why that becomes an important tool when you're planning for things like estate taxes. I've given it to my kids, but I've essentially given them the control over when it's going to get to them. But it's also not mine when they to look to try and look at my estate taxes or for Medicaid planning. It's not really mine. I gave it away five years ago outside of the divestment period, so I didn't give it away anticipating for Medicaid. I might have actually did that, but that's just so instead, it's now, but it's still under my control. It's still going to the kids when I want it to, how I want it to. It stays in the family. That's the core of how these strategies operate. And that's going to get at the difference between an irrevocable and revocable trust. Now, we covered specialized legal issues. We covered specialized property. The last part is going to be... Uh, specialized gifts. This is going to be one of the most critical areas. If you have terms of a gift that you want to give away, let's say you have an adult child who never really grew up. They can't hold a job. Maybe they have bad habits. Uh, then you know I cannot give them large amounts of money. I can't give them $20,000 on a Friday because by Monday they may not be alive. Uh, if that's the case and you have a situation like that, or if I give it away and it'll just be completely eaten up by creditors or uh, something along those lines, then I need, or they'll just spend it all on stupid stuff that I don't want them to spend it on, then I need to set up a trust for them. If I'm going to set up a separate trust for them that would be irrevocable and I control the terms of it, I probably don't want that broadcast across the entire world in a probate. So setting up the trust out of the will may not be smart or I may change my mind. I may want to change some of the conditions of that over time. The revocable trust becomes a very good option. Uh, another example of wanting to control the gift. You love your child. You love your grandchildren. You think your child married an idiot and you absolutely do not want your child's spouse to get any of your hard-earned money. 
Okay, that's fine. Then we need to set up a revocable living trust for you because then we can kind of modify the gift. We can make sure that the terms of that trust change depending upon your comfort level. You can still control the money and how the gift is given after you're gone. Uh, another common one is, I love my kids. I think they're smart with money, but I still want them to work hard for a living. So I don't really want to get much benefit until they reach the age of 50, 60, 83, whatever it is. Uh, again, you're going to be holding that and you're going to be controlling that, doling that money out according to your terms, well, a trust is going to be used in some capacity for that. Using a revocable trust is going to be the best option, again, to maximize privacy. Uh, there's also special needs trusts and a few others. So if you want to maintain control for some reason, then the use of a trust is going to be a very good thing. The last one is privacy. Uh, the best way I can explain this is a story. It revolves around something called a holographic will. A uh, holographic will is those dramatic scenes you see in the movies where people handwrite wills and then uh, die, and that is honored as the will. It was a very common practice. There are still some states that honor it. Wisconsin doesn't. But this is a story to kind of get across the idea of the public nature of a will. Once upon a time, there was a farmer. He had a wife and two daughters. The farmer kissed his wife and daughters and went out into the fields. Very early in the morning, the tractor started to back up over him. They later on found him that day when he didn't come home for dinner and he died in the hospital. Now, during the day in the fields with the tractor on top of him, he took out his pocket knife and carved the will into the fender of the tractor. They found that, they took the fender off, cut off the piece that was relevant, and probated that as the will. That will is still on display in the courthouse today. The will is a public document. The moral of the story is the terms of the will, the inventory of the assets of the probate, that's all discoverable for people online. Or at least maybe not online, but definitely if they go down to the courthouse. You may or may not want that for the terms of what you have for limiting your kids' access to things. In which case, if that's the case, you may want to use a trust to maximize more of your privacy. For some people, that's a large concern. For others, they think, I'm dead. Uh, if that privacy is a concern of yours, talking with an attorney to see if the trust is going to be a good thing is a smart idea. Trusts are very, very powerful tools. You have to be very purposeful, though, if you're going to use them in your estate. They can be expensive, you've got to set them up, you've got to fund them, you have to make sure property gets into the trust. Big pretend boxes don't pack themselves, you've got to do that. If you don't, then you might have something that doesn't completely work or doesn't the plan doesn't work the way it should. So talking with an attorney is a great step to make sure that your plans, your values are protected and carried through when you can. If you're looking at that, please keep this in mind. Give us a call again, 920-831-0300 and schedule a consultation. We can talk through the benefits and the drawbacks, the costs and the advantages, and make sure that we have a plan that fits right for you. Because at Peterson, Burke & Cross, we specialize in you.